Thank you. So if we move on to the main items of business, um, the minutes of the meeting held on the 12th of September 2018 have been on the table for the last half an hour. Do I have your permission to sign them as a true record? Agreed. Thank you. Um, Kumwa, any apologies for absence? Declarations of interest. Thank you, Chairman. I've received from Councillor Mike Band a non-pecuniary interest in relation to agenda item 8.2, land adjacent to um, Wheel Cottage on the basis that he's the borough's representative on the Surrey Hills AONB board. And from Councillor Dinas, um, a non-pecuniary interest again um, in relation to land adjacent to Byway Cottage as he is the chairman of the Alfred Sports and Social Club, which is based at the recreation ground that backs on the application site. He, he may wish, wish to add further or clarify. And uh, sorry, Ch um, um, Chairman, also uh, development manager uh, Beth Hallon smith has an interest in item um, B3 Woodgers with a G, uh, 94 Horsham Road, and she will leave the room. Thank you. Um, any questions by members of the public or from members? Um, I'm afraid there's none. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, Beth, would you like to run through any relevant updates to government guidance for us, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, on the 1st of October, regulations governing the imposition of pre-commencement conditions came into force. From this date, planning permission may not be granted subject to a pre-commencement condition without the written agreement of the applicant to the terms of the condition, except with the, expe except with the exception of specific cir circumstances. For clarity, a pre-commencement condition for this purpose is one which is imposed on a grant of full planning permission, but not an outline permission, and which must be complied with either before any building or operation comprised in the development is begun, or in the case of a change of use before the material change of use occurs. The rationale behind this piece of legislation is the hope that local planning authorities will discuss conditions, including any pre-commencement conditions, during the processing of the application and before a final decision is made. The lo local planning authority is expected to share with the applicant any draft pre-commencement conditions at the earliest opportunity. If the, if the applicant confirms their agreement to a pre-commencement condition in writing, then the pre-commencement condition can be imposed. Where the local planning authority has not been able to obtain written agreement, it can serve a notice under the regulations which must state the condition, the full reasons for proposing it, and an instruction that any substantive response must be received within 10 working days from the date the notice is given. If the local planning authority does not receive a substantive response, the condition can be imposed without the written agreement of the applicant. This means, in practice, that planning committees can no longer impose pre-commencement conditions. It will therefore be imperative for officers and members to engage with each other early on in the application process if it is considered that pre-commencement conditions are required. On occasion, there will be times when the committee, upon reflection, um, would like to see an additional condition imposed which would ordinarily be a pre-commencement condition. In cases such as these, it may be that the desired outcome could be used, could be achieved using alternative wording such as prior to any above-ground works or prior to occupation in order for it not to constitute a pre-commencement condition. The, appropriate, the appropriateness of this approach will need to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis, <coughs> which highlights the need for early officer and member engagement. If it becomes apparent during a committee meeting that a pre-commencement condition is essential, the committee resolution to approve will need to be subject to a time period for agreement from the applicant, and a full reason for refusal will need to be drafted by the committee in the event that the applicant does not agree. The committee would need to be satisfied that, in the absence of this condition, the application would be fundamentally unacceptable so that a reason for um, a, re a refusal on this basis could be robustly defended at appeal. And a briefing note will be shortly issued to all members on this. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Beth. You're struggling with your cold still, aren't you? <laughs> Sorry to uh, come back at you. Would you like to present the performance against government targets for us, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
So on your update sheet, you'll notice that the, um, the performance on the government target for speed is um, being met, and likewise on the performance for quality. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Beth. So we move on to the main items of business, the applications for planning permission. Um, but please note that two of the applications on your agenda, Chapel Fields and land adjacent to Byway Cottage, both in Allfold, are no longer on the agenda as these have been withdrawn due to technical changes. So the first item for consideration this evening is item A1, which is application reference WA oblique 2017 oblique 2309, land adjacent to Wheel Cottage, the street Hascombe, GU84JJ. The proposal is for the erection of four dwellings with associated car parking, landscaping and amenity space together with a new access. And Nicola, would you like to present this application, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. This application seeks planning permission for four dwellings on land between Wheel Cottage and Rose Cottages in Hascombe. There are no updates since the writing of this report. This slide shows a location plan. The application south. The site is bisected by a stream which runs south to north. The main part of the site is overgrown with colonising plants including bramble, Himalayan and balsam, with an air of woodland at the east of the site. This woodland separates the site from a footpath or track and the more open area of fields and agricultural land further east. This slide shows an aerial photograph of the site and surrounding properties, showing more clearly the area of woodland to the east of the site with the track and the agricultural fields and wider countryside. This slide is an extract from the 2002 proposals map showing Hascombe with the approximate site location marked in red. As you can see, the site itself is located outside of the Haskin settlement boundary, and it is also with the, within the Greenbelt and within the AONB. Whilst the site is located within the Greenbelt, the proposal for new dwellings is not considered to constitute inappropriate development, as it falls within one of the exceptions listed within the MPPF, namely limited infilling within a village. This application shows a block plan. This, application, this slide shows a block plan. The proposed development is for four dwellings, two semi-detached two-bedroom dwellings, a detached two-storey three-bedroom dwelling, a single four-bedroom bungalow. It also includes an area of car parking with six visitor spaces proposed at the south of the site. These are to provide visitor spaces for the houses and also to replace two informal car parking spaces that would be lost by creating the site access. The separation distance from Rose Cottage to Unit 1 is 17, approximately 17 metres, and to the car parking area, approximately 12 metres. The intervening area is proposed to be occupied by low-lying landscaping and the access into the car parking area. The separation distance from Unit 4 to the Wheel Cottage is 19 metres, and from Unit 4 to the boundary of the site is 2 metres. The application also includes a proposal to create a new channel for the stream, somewhat to the east of the existing channel, to provide more space for garden and amenity space. The Environment Agency, Lead Local Flood Authority and Surrey Wildlife Trust have been consulted extensively in this proposal, and subject conditions do not object. This slide presents an extract from the flood risk assessment showing the existing and the proposed course of the stream. The furthest distance from between the existing and proposed channel is 20 metres. The local lead flood authority has already commented on the design and made recommendations which has led to the more meandering nature of the channel shown here. It should be noted the red line area shown here is the original red line. The application was later reconsulted on the red line area shown in the previous slides. These are the proposed elevations. They show the semi-detached dwellings, which are at a height of 8.13 metres, the detached two-storey dwelling at a height of 7.96 metres, and the bungalow. The detail in the front elevations will be broken up by a mixture of front gable features, bay windows, porches, and dormer windows. This slide shows the proposed floor plans for plots one and two. 
Each property would comprise a kitchen, living and dining areas on the ground floor with two bedrooms on the first floor. Two car parking spaces are proposed to be provided alongside each of the dwellings. These are the proposed floor plans for plot three. Property would comprise three bedrooms at the first floor with kitchen, living, dining areas on the ground floor. The dwelling also includes an integral garage, which meets the required space standards and a further car parking space provided in front of the garage, which also meets the size standards required. This is a proposed floor plan for plot four, the bungalow. Also have three bedrooms and an integrated garage with a further parking space in front of the garage, both of which meet size standards. This slide shows examples of house design opposite on the street in Hascombe, on the other side of the road. This slide shows the view um, of one rose cottages, which runs along part of the, forms the southern boundary of the site. As mentioned, there's a separation of 17 metres between the nearest proposed dwelling, plot one, and this property with low-level landscaping proposed between this house and the car park. This slide, this slide shows photographs of the access. The slide on the left shows the existing access into the site, which is currently used for informal parking. This area of informal parking will be lost if the access to the site is created, but as previously mentioned, two parking spaces are supplemented within the proposed car parking court area. The slide to the right shows the grassed verge and tree which lie between the site and the road, with a further area of informal parking in front of part of the site in front of the wheel cottage that's not proposed to be affected. Determining issues on this matter of principle and technical opinion, matter of principle on development within the Greenbelt, uh, biodiversity and flood risk. Matters of judgment are impact on visual amenity and character of the AMB and impacts on residential amenity. For the reasons set out in the officer report, the application is recommendation for approval, that is recommendation A, subject to the completion of Section 106 agreement and the proposed conditions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Nicola. Now, uh, this application is subject to public speaking, and I'd like to invite the agent, Nick Cobbold, to... Uh... <coughs> Good evening, Mr Cobbold. I understand the procedure has been explained to you, so you have four minutes from when you start speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, officers, as well, for the report and the presentation. Um, normally, I sit here with a paper prepared of what I'm going to say, and then I have to scrap it to respond to objectors. But um, we haven't got any of them today, so I think that's um, it's a useful starting point for what I'm going to say. Um, Third-party comments, 12 letters of objection, but you, not, maybe not uniquely, but um, certainly rarely 13 letters of support. A parish council also sitting on the fence, unable to reach an agreement, no objection to the scheme. Support for a planning application, yeah, it's pretty unheard of, let alone an application for residential development in the Greenbelt. Why is there this support? Um, from what we can work out, it's because many of the people in the village realise that there's, there's a real need for housing in the village. There's a real need for small housing in the village and bungalows as well. It will help support the local infrastructure, which ironically dovetails with the comments of the objectors, actually, who cite the lack of infrastructure as a reason for objecting to the scheme. The support for local in infrastructure, I'm just going to take you to the MPPF, which came out in July, only two and a half months ago, and I'll give you a quote. To promote sustainable development in rural areas, housing should be located where it will enhance or maintain the vitality of rural communities. It continues... Planning policies should identify opportunities for villages to grow and thrive, especially where this will support local services. Where there are groups of smaller settlements, development in one village may support services in villages nearby. So, whilst on one hand, Hascombe might not be so flush with facilities itself, OK, there's a sports pitch, pub, village hall, church, it relies on the facilities of other settlements as well. So we're not just talking about the sustainability of this settlement, we're talking about the wider sustainability of others, such as Busbridge, um, Hambledon, for example. Haskins on a bus route, links it to Cranley, Godalming, Guildford. So whilst, yeah, there will be reliance on the private motor car, it's not an essential need. But the other objections, we'll ignore the lack of need for housing, because I think that's pretty established. Um, the other questions are about vehicle movements and the other technical issue of the stream, which you've just heard about. Um, 
There's a perception that the 30 mile an hour limit here is not effective, but yet a speed survey we, we carried out during the course of the application said it actually northbound and southbound, it's almost exactly 30 miles an hour. Um, the transport statement concludes that the proposals will generate three vehicle movements during peak hours and 26 vehicle movements over the course of the day. So we're talking sort of just one every 20 minutes or so at peak times, reduced obviously outside those times. I'm not going to dwell on the principle of development because I think officers have covered that, but visually the proposal relates to the surrounding properties. And this is obviously how the green belt support is there as a limited infill in the green belt. So the site is flanked on both sides by residential dwellings, as you've seen, and it makes it an obvious infill plot. Final technical point was the stream, which, sorry, and the provision of parking, which I've not addressed so far. So many of the objections, so those 12 objections I told you about, they were actually registered before the technical response to the stream and the technical design of the stream was submitted. Um, that's all there now with a flood risk assessment. The stream is going to be fully engineered and it will help the flow of water rather than hinder the flow of water. And the increased banks will ensure against flooding as well. So it's a benefit. The other benefit is the parking to the south of the site. This was initially suggested when we started the project to alleviate some of the on-road parking, and that's how it's panned out in terms of the two spaces which will um, replace the ones on the roadside, which will be lost. Um, no problem with this being secured through a 106 agreement as per the B part of the recommendation. Um, we will work on that, hopefully, if you will support the application. So I hope you can now grant permission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cobold. Excellent timing. Thank you. Members, Councillor Seaborn. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Um, the decision to, to call this uh, application in was, uh, it's already been articulated by the agent. Um, the, everything seems to be sitting right on the fence with this one. The uh, objectors and supporters are, are about in equal number and the, the parish council was well and truly divided. So we, we, we rather thought that it'd be a good opportunity to, to get a broader perspective of our learned, from our learned colleagues on this, uh, see if they have anything to add to the, um, the, the excellent material that's been presented in the report. I find it a very, very good thorough report. Uh, <clears throat> I think the basic issue here is, does Hascombe actually uh, need these extra houses? Um, we've heard that the, you know, the new buildings are very much in keeping with the, uh, the street scene in the street, and I, I totally support that. I, I'm down there regularly, and uh, the design that's in front of us fits in very well with uh, the surrounding buildings. Um, parking's been brought up. Parking is an issue in uh, Hascombe. I've, I've, I'm currently working with the parish council to see if we can get some better parking arrangements sorted out in, in Mare Lane, only about 100 metres from this site. So the fact that good consideration has been given uh, and, and plenty of parking has been provided is, is a big plus point in, uh, in, in this development. It would, be, um, uh, it would be remiss for it not to be covered because Hascombe is very dependent on the car. Um, it has no shops uh, and uh, people will be using cars regularly. So the provision for car parking appears to be very good. Um, it's also been pointed out that MPPF allows for limited infill outside the settlement boundary. Um, and that's exactly what this, uh, this development offers. Um, what has changed since previous applications is that uh, the local plan has come into force and the, the small villages are expected to make a contribution to, uh, through windfall sites to the numbers of houses that Waverley needs. So um, we've heard that Hascombe will, um, needs a small amount of additional housing. This will contribute to, uh, to Waverley's windfall targets for the smaller villages. And so on balance, the, you know, it's a good report, it addresses all the issues, and uh, I'm minded to support the recommendation. But as I said earlier, I'd be very interested to hear what perspectives colleagues bring to this before we close it out. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I'll listen to other people okay. before. Nobody else looks. Thank you. Councillor Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I too, it's a good report. Uh, <clears throat> 
I mean, the settlement has been drawn in such a way as to include all the houses in that area and sort of goes in where there, there were houses missing. Um, I suspect uh, if, if the next time they draw the settlement boundary, it, it might be slightly different. This does seem to me to be legitimate infilling in the green belt. I, I, am, I think the design of the houses is good. I think it covers the, the needs of Hascombe and, and or Waverley as a whole. The one thing where I think we, we, there might be sort of uh, problems potentially is having two parking spaces that for, are for people in the area but are not on that, that don't live in these three um, or in, in the proposed dwellings that are going to be erected I, I can just see sort of sort of warfare between the local inhabitants and the people that reside there to ensure that uh, only two of those places are used um, presumably it won't be for any particular people or it, it may be for two particular houses um, that would be better than it just generally being available for the public of Hascombe, who I can see will all be going in there. And if two have already used it and there's a spare space, I can see them using three and then the local residents can't park their, house, their cars themselves. I'm not quite sure how one overcomes that, but I, I can see that as a potential problem on a practical basis. But I, I am in favour of uh, approving this application from what I've read. Thank you. Councillor Townsend. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed with the design of the semi-detached houses, um, and I'm a bit disappointed that the, the houses don't meet the technical space standards in some areas. Um, however, my um, main um, concern about this application is the incomplete biological records. Um, I think the ecology report makes it clear that um, the client went against their advice regarding the biological reports. And on page 26 of the actual ecology study, it states, um, this is um, the ecologist, biological records data has not been obtained or authorised by the client against the advice of Arbtech. Without these records, the death study is incomplete and a robust assessment of the protected species in the area cannot be made. Information regarding non-statutory designated species has also not been obtained, so impact on these areas cannot be assessed. This is against woodland. I think the ecologist recognises that there are um, the protected, the um, uh, likelihood of protected species, especially bats, is, is high. And I'm just a little bit concerned that a, a bat report was not carried out um, or other protected species report was not carried out. Um, I know that officers refer to Natural England, but they just refer to their, their standing advice. And their standing advice is that survey reports and mitigation plans are required for development projects that could affect, could affect protected species as part of getting planning permission or a mitigation licence. Surveys need to show whether protected species are present in the area or nearby and how they use the site. Um, I am very concerned that, as this is actually marked on the MAGIC database um, as part of the site's priority habitat, as far as I understand, and yet we are looking to agree this development um, without the necessary surveys, and, and I am extremely concerned about that and would like to know, perhaps from officers, why this is the case. Thank you. Thank you. Um, officers, would you like to firstly address the... Um parking conundrum that may arise and, and then um, Councillor Townsend's concerns about the protected species. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. With regard to the parking, each of the houses has been provided with two parking spaces for their use. The parking court is predominantly focused on visitors' spaces to the development, so each, car, each house has two spaces with the addition provided for visitors. We um, have required we would request that a parking management strategy be submitted um, as part of the Section 106 management of the parking area, and we would anticipate that coming up with a strategy at that time to manage how the parking spaces would be managed. Um, with regard to the uh, conservation and nature conservation, we have consulted um, all information submitted to us has been sent to Surrey Wildlife Trust 
who are our consultants on these issues, they have responded and they have um, said that they have they'd advised the details now provided uh, concerning streams of considerable for otters, address our concerns, um, providing the current development plans do not affect woodland habitat to the east of the stream and this woodland is protected, we would advise that legally protected dormers are much likely, less likely to be adversely. Um, so they have no objection following that. Um, we have proposed a condition to, that a, that a, uh, to, uh, the, for a tree protection plan to be submitted for the woodland, to include the woodland, and we are satisfied, officers are satisfied, that this would address um, Surrey Wildlife Trust concerns regarding woodland. So we, we, Surrey Wildlife Trust has had a number of opportunities to consider this and has no objection on the application. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Townsend, you wish to come back. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to come back. Um, I read the Surrey Wildlife letter and response, and it didn't actually say they did not object. They said that the ARBTEC report contains enough information for the planning authority to make up their mind. I'm not sure that that can be construed and um, that going that we should go against what a qualified ecologist should say. So the Surrey Wildlife Trust do not actually um, make an objection or support the application. They then go on to say about the river and ask, make specific comments about the otters and the um, crayfish and say that it's not suitable habitat. But the first part of their actual response specifically states that it's up to, up to us to come to a decision on the report submitted by the ecologist. And the ecologist specifically states themselves that it went against their advice. So I am concerned that we are considering that it's the habitat regulations that we are going against that because we do not know what protected species are using this site and we have got no idea, and sorry, Wildlife Trust hasn't said in their response that, that they agree that there is no damage to the protected species. Um, so I, I'm afraid that pending that, I, I, I cannot at this particular moment in time support the application based on the information and I don't feel that we are in compliance with the habitats regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Band. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> well, I, I think, this, as others have said, this is a very much on balance uh, application. Uh, and, and in particular, seeing it is situated within the AOMB, I think we do need to be particularly careful. Because AOMB provides the highest level of pr landscape protection that, that we have. Uh, and I, I don't think this report at the moment fully addresses the planning Manage, the planning management policies which are in the AOMB management plan, which Waverley, of course, have adopted. Um, I think the issue of long distance views is not what the AOMB management plan talks about. It talks about the, the impact on, on, the, on the site itself. Um, however, having said all that, uh, and the fact, recognizing the fact that the AOMB washes over the whole of the village, this is a pretty sensible infill site to, to use. So I think we could have made more of the grounds why th this is acceptable within the AOMB, because I think we must be seen to be protecting the AOMB wherever we reasonably can, and, and, and be more specific as to the reasons why we actually agree with lim limited infill in, in areas of this de designation. So, on balance, recognising you know, pragmatically where this site is and how it relates to the village, I, I am prepared to support it. But I do think, as a, as a message, we need to be strongly be seen to be supporting the AOMB and the restrictions on development which that implies. Uh, as members will know, we've been roundly criticised by outside bodies elsewhere for uh, not for conceding the use of the AOMB for housing applications. And personally, in those applications, I think there were special circumstances which we were entirely justified in, in adopting. But I think we say need to be strongly seen to be supporting the AOMB and the limits that this provides. That doesn't say we can't have housing in the AOMB, but we just need to be very specific as to wh when we go and, and, and why we do it. But on this occasion, I think common sense dictates we, sh we should allow this application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Band. Councillor Dinas. Thank you. Um, some of my points have been made, but it's just a, a bit of clarity on the parking. Um, so we've got plots one and two, which are two bedroom. 
So if my memory serves me right, that should be two parking spaces um, from the policy. I just want to get my figures correct on this. Um, I believe plot four should have two and a half and possibly plot three. So that should be a total of nine if my recollection of the parking policy is correct. So if that's the case, we're providing six. And I just firstly wanted to make sure I've got my understanding for the residents, whether that's correct, when you read the first bit on page 10, when it goes through the plots, um, plot numbers. Um, very quickly, I don't, I, there is no condition about water. Um, we normally have a, a condition about, I think it's 110 litres of water. I, I couldn't find that, but to be fair, with so many applications, you have to keep checking to make sure your knowledge is correct. So I didn't see one on that, so that's a bit of a concern. And page 23, I do find it quite disappointing sometimes because accepting that um, published standards for room sizes is guidance and it's not policy, but it's guidance and therefore we should take it into account. None of the proposed dwellings actually meet the publicised standards. But we sort of dismiss it saying, well, that's okay. But is it? You know, you know, we're building premises, we're giving you know, permissions for properties for the future, and we're already saying that none of them actually meet the standards, and I'm quite uncomfortable on that. Um, I have to admit, the, the case put up by Councillor Townsend, I think there are lots and lots of questions there which cause me concern, um, but I'll be interested to hear what other people say. Thank you. Um, the, the parking numbers are detailed at the bottom of page 23, and each unit has two allocated or a garage in a space and then there are the, the additional spaces alongside so each house ha has its own two car spaces yeah but plot, and plot three and plot four though uh, have two am I correct in saying and I think the standard is two and a half for, for that size so it is one short then well, the two halves are in the parking bay alongside, aren't they, for visitors? Well, you've got eight spaces plus the plus the six. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Councillor Byam. Thank you. Um, well, two things. First of all, uh, point that Councillor Goodridge made about the, the the local plan of drawing the line so tight. I think it's, I think it was you. Um, I was on the committee that actually did worked on those all those years ago, and we literally did or were advised to draw lines around all of the existing dwellings and leave everything else open so that they could come forward for development. But there was a, an opportunity to control development, and this is an obvious site where development, I think, is, is justified. Uh, the reason we called to the meeting um, was because the parish council could not... Uh, reach a conclusion themselves at that particular planning meeting all of the residents who were visiting all were very supportive of it but on previous applications and previous times they've been against it so I presume that they're all mainly satisfied although and as in the reports I think just slightly more support are supportive of the application than those objecting and I think they have, their supporting views seem to be more more sensible, but nevertheless, I, I, I am supportive of this application, and I think it, uh, it, it, they've covered all the ground in, in, uh, with regard to water. We talked about water. Uh, th there is, of course, a, uh, a, pu a public pump just up the road if they want to go and collect water. I digress silly. Um, so I'm supportive of the application. Members, any other comments before we move to the recommendation? Right, so, recommendation A is that subject to the completion of a Section 106 agreement to establish a management company and secure appropriate contributions for the management and maintenance of the car park area and conditions 1 to 25 and informatives 1 to 14, permission be granted. All those in favour, please.
Is Mary sitting at the back? Yeah. So, uh, yes, members, that, that uh, recommendation is um, granted. And then we move to recommendation B, that in the event of a Section 106 agreement is not completed within six months of the date of the resolution to grant outline permission, permission be refused for the reasons set out on page 40. All those in favour, please. So that um, second recommendation is also approved. Now we move on to item B1, which is application reference WA oblique 2018, oblique 1210, Plonks Farm, Churchill, Shamley Green, GU50UD, and the proposal is the construction of an outdoor swimming pool. And Matt, I'd invite you to present this application, please. Thank you, Chairman. The location plan on the screen shows the location of the development. Um, it's located to the east of Church Hill. Um, Plonk's farm itself is a detached grade two listed building without buildings located here to the east, which are both ancillary. The site is located within the green belt, the AOMB, the AGLV, and the <coughs> conservation area. The aerial photo here shows the location of the dwelling with neighbors to the north and to the south and the residential curtilage of Plonk's Farm, which I'm roughly drawing around now. The block plan on the screen shows the location of the proposed swimming pool, which would have a width of five metres, a length of 11 metres, and be positioned seven metres from the boundary with the neighbour to the north. The air source heat pump is as where my mouse is pointing, which would have an approximate height of 1.4 metres and be located 1.1 metres from the boundary. The swimming pool has already been constructed um, and the photos here show the swimming pool as it is. So this is taken from the uh, corner closest to the neighbour where the air source heat pump is, looking down towards the south, again towards the main dwelling. This is the air source heat pump, um, and again looking towards the neighbour from here. So in terms of the determining issues, um, our matters of principle and technical opinion are the impacts on the heritage asset, uh, which our conservation and heritage officer has as said does not result in any harm, the impact on residential amenity, which officers consider to be acceptable, the impact on green belts, which officers consider to be uh, within one of the exceptions listed in paragraph 145 of the MPPF, and the design and visual amenity. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Matt. Members, Councillor Baird. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, uh, the, the, the issue originally on this application, when it was first uh, lodged, was the impact, from my perspective, was the impact on the residential amenity of the neighbouring property. Because at that stage, um, the screening which we've seen on the photographs that uh, Matt has produced, and perhaps, oh, by the way, I should go back and say thank you for organising the site visit. I think um, most of us found that very helpful. Uh, the screening which is shown there alongside the, the house and behind the... the uh, the air source heat pump wasn't there, and the client, the applicant, had removed um, some 20 foot high cupressus hedge in, in that area where that screen now is. And if you look at the overhead photograph, which, you sh which Matt showed, if you could put it back on again, you can just see in the, 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 the top corner of the field that the hedge went right, the, the cupressus hedge went right the way along. And it certainly did have a major impact, from my perspective, on the neighbouring property. What we've seen happen subsequently is that the, the applicant has done the sensible thing and put some screening in there, not just the, uh, the hedge, but as we saw on the site visit, a fair amount of vegetation has gone in as well. So all, although I acknowledge that the uh, neighbour still isn't entirely happy with that, whether it's sufficient or not, I have to suggest that on balance it probably is adequate um, you know, and, and leads to a, a reasonable protection of the amenity of the next door property. So uh, I, I'm happy to live with that. But I think the only two things that I would say is it's very much that, that amenity, the impact on amenity is very much dependent on the preservation of that boundary and also the way that the, uh, um, 
the bank between the two properties, and what you can't see from the photographs, both of us who saw it on site, that the, the applicant property is significantly higher than the neighbouring property. And so in removing the trees, the applicant has built up the bank with uh, wooden timbers supporting. So I think two things, we need to somehow protect the amenity by ensuring that A, the, the screen remains and is maintained, and B, the, uh, the, the structural protection of the the, the embankment build-up is also uh, uh, maintained and, and retained. So I don't know, I'd like some advice from officers how we, how we might be able to do that with, uh, with, with conditions. So uh, I, I would welcome some comments from officers on that, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Ban. Yes, this was discussed with officers and um, they did say that they would come up with a suitable condition or informative. So over to you, Matt. I think you're taking... Yes, so we have drafted a condition which, if members agree with, can be included on the any decision issued, which is within three months of this decision, details of the boundary treatment shall be submitted to and approved in writing to the local planning authority. The development shall be carried out in strict accordance with the approved details and retained thereafter. I mean, that seems to be entirely adequate to me, and on that basis, I certainly will support the application. I agree. Uh, Councillor Dinas. I'm grateful for that condition because um, I think it does make the decision quite an easy decision. I do find it extremely frustrating when people just build in breach of planning permission and then go retrospective. It is a real shame that we can't give them a financial penalty for doing this. I find it incredibly frustrating when we're just presented with, well, they've already built it and everything else. Well, they should put the planning permission in first let it be decided and then build it. It's just a bit of a bugbear. It makes me very cross. I'm delighted that we've come up with a condition that satisfies us. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gray. Thank you. Um, I feel very uncomfortable with us, similar to Councillor Dina's, of us turning around. This is a grade two listed building. Um, they knowingly went and erected this swimming pool. Um, it does have an impact on its neighbour. And I very much regret if we have to approve this. I think there should be some penalty. There should be some sanction. Um, I mean, what does this say to other people with similar, similar buildings in a similar um, highly graded um, area, such as an AONB, um, that they can go ahead and do this? That's all really I want to comment on. Thank you. Anybody else would you like to comment? Uh, so we move to the recommendation, that, which is that subject to conditions one and two and the new condition three, as just stated by the officers, and informatives one to two, permission be granted. All those in favour, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Against? Abstentions. Okay. So that uh, permission is granted. Um, right, item B2, application reference WA, oblique 2018, oblique 1372, uh, 1 to 17, Woodyers Close, Wanish, GU 50RR, um, application under regulation 3 of the Town and Country Planning General Regulations 1992 for installation of replacement windows at numbers 1 to 17. Chris, would you like to present this for us, please? Sorry? Oh, Nicholas presenting it. Sorry, it says Chris down here. Thank you, Chairman. This is a um, council, Waverley Borough Council application, so it's been brought to committee. The application seeks to change green UPVC double glazed windows to white UPVC double glazed windows. This is the application site. It's uh, located within Wanish, within the Wanish Conservation Area. It's set back from the main road frontages and includes 17 dwellings and a community centre. These are the proposed elevations. Um, it's uh, predominantly bungalows with some one and a half storey buildings. Uh, the photographs here illustrate the green windows, the green and white double glazed windows that are currently in existence. There's um, a range of different shades of green and slightly different um, 
white and green striped windows. Um, you can see the different variations here. It's proposed to replace these windows with white UPVC double glazed. Uh, with regard to matters of principle and technical opinion, um, the impact on the conservation area, with regard to matters of judgment, the impact on the green belt, design impact of visual amenity and impact on residential amenity. Um, for the reasons set out in the officer's report, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Nicola. Members, Councillor Goodry. Thank, <coughs> thank you. As a local member, I have no problem with this at all. Um, it, it just, what I wanted to say was um, there's reference to different colours as to what the current uh, windows are. It, it refers on page 61, second paragraph up. The existing windows are double glazed grey. Um, there is one house that's got grey, uh, which I think is 16 or 17. Um, the rest are white with, with the openings being green because um, they're then referred uh, on page 54, green double glazed you be proposed to be replaced. Um, it seems to me that predominantly they're white at the moment and they're going to be white when we have new ones, except the openers will be white as well. I have no problem with it whatsoever. Anybody else like to comment? Right, we'll move to the recommendation then. Which is that subject to conditions one to two and informative one, permission be granted. All those in favour, please. So, moving on to the... Oh, Beth, are you leaving us or...? <laughs> So item B3 is application reference WA oblique 20, 2018 oblique 1365 Woodgers with a G 94 Horsham Road Cranley GU6 8DY and the proposal is for the erection of extensions and alterations and Matt if you'd like to introduce this thing. Thank you Chairman. The application has been brought before committee as the agent is related to an employee of the council within the planning department. The location plan on the screen shows where the dwelling is, uh, with 92 to the north and 96 to the south. It should be of note that 92 has apparently recently, by judging by the brickwork, built an extension which infills this square here. So the proposed plan is for the erection of extensions which would be on the northern elevation. Uh, the first part which adjoins the main building is Supposed to be one and a half storeys to match the existing ridge line with dormers and a rear roof light, and this part to the rear to be single storey. So the existing elevations are on the screen. Uh, as you can see, one and a half storey building with uh, accommodation in the roof space provided by way of these four dormers, and the proposed elevations for those same uh, facing are proposed here. So the proposed extension would mirror that of the existing dwelling maintaining the ridge line and proposing a new dormer, as well as this new single storey element. Uh, from the side here, again, you can see the existing elevations with the proposed, um, with the most notable part here being the erection of the single storey element. The proposed floor plans are now on the screen for members' consideration. Uh, as you'll be able to see, the extension will have its own entrance, its own dining area, with bedrooms uh, two downstairs and bedroom one upstairs, which would be served by an ensuite. However, this area would also be connected to the main dwelling through here and also share an access here so officers are satisfied that it would be an extension subject to the main house. These photos have been taken from the front of the site. So the one in the top right here is from the road with number 92 uh, just here. This is the space that the extension would fill in, so coming off the ridge and then coming down, down the side here, and more closely and more laterally here. From the side, this is where the extensions would be coming out from, um, straight off that wall there. And these are of the neighbouring development. So as you can see, the previously mentioned uh, extension 
on the neighbouring dwelling here, which is serviced on this elevation by a high roof light. Uh, not roof light, high level light on the side there. So coming to the determining issues, um, matters of principle and technical opinion are the impact on parking, with the matters of judgment being the design and the impact on visual amenity and the impact on residential amenity. And as I've laid out in the officer's report, officers are recommending approval for this. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Matt. Uh, members? Councillor Ellis. Thank you, Chairman. Forgive me if I've missed this, and whether it's relevant or not, I'm not quite sure. But is this a granny annex? You look, there are two sitting rooms, two lounges, two um, other pieces of accommodation, but only one kitchen. And the reason I ask this is, if it is actually going to be a granny annex or something like that, should we have an additional condition there that says it, it remains ancillary to the main building? Otherwise, look into the future, perhaps it could be divided into two properties. Thank you. Thank you, officers. Um, if members feel that that would be sufficient, a condition can be added to ensure that it remains ancillary to the host dwelling. Councillor Ellis, would you you'd like such a condition added? Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, members yes, in I agreement would. with that? Yeah, I think, I think everybody's in agreement with that. Okay. Anybody else like to comment on this application? Right. So the recommendation is that subject to conditions one and two, and the new condition three regarding. Um, future occupancy and informative one permission be granted. All those in favour, please. Unanimous, Chairman. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, we have no items to consider and exempt, so um, I'll close the meeting and thank you all for your attendance. Thank you. <laughs>